Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. Uh, When Jesus began his ministry here on earth, He started out by gathering together 12 followers called disciples. And these disciples became the foundation stones uh, of the Christian church. They they were the sustainers of Jesus Christ's ministry here on earth. And Jesus Christ made it very clear from the start that what he was calling these men to do, he was also calling all the men and women that came after them to do as well. The call that Jesus had for these disciples in that day is the same call that he has for you and me today. See this in Matthew 4, 18, 19. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. And Matthew, the disciple that wrote this, was a tax accountant. And so he was into details. So he wants you to know that these guys casting a net into the sea, they were fishermen. Okay? Because the difference between fishing and just standing on the bank is a fine line. Okay? Okay. Some of you will get that tomorrow. Okay? (laughs) Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you, and I want to stop the verse right there, even even though uh, you may know what Jesus said, Uh, but I want to stop there and make the case that what Jesus said to the followers in that day is the same thing that he says to his followers today. What he called them to do, he calls us to do. Follow me, follow me. We're to be a Christ follower, that's what a disciple does. He follows Follow me and I will make you. And I want you to stop and consider it in a fresh way. If you you didn't know what Jesus was going to say, what would be some of your guesses? Follow me and I will make you holy. I'll take the sin out of your life. I'll make you perfect. That's not what he says. Follow me and I will make you more spiritual. You'll you'll read your Bible and pray all all the time. That's not what he says. Follow me and I will make you a great student, a great parent, a great businessman. I'll give you a lot of success in life if you'll follow me. That's not what he says. He offers us all of those things if we follow him, but that is not what he calls his followers to do. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Luke's gospel says, from now on, you will fish for people. Now, when I bring up this topic of evangelism, often you can feel the tension rise in the room. I mean, maybe for you right now, there is a a tightness in your stomach that wasn't there when you came to church tonight. There is an emotion attached to sharing your faith And it primarily is a negative emotion. It's amazing how the emotion that we feel about our own salvation is so different than the emotion that we feel when we think about sharing the gospel. The emotion about our own salvation is very positive. The emotion about sharing the gospel can be very negative. And so I just want to alleviate your fears. I want to release uh, uh, some, some of the tension. I want to just tell you what this series is, is about. You know, last week, Pastor Ryland explained what the gospel is. He just marched us through John 3.16 and clarified what the gospel is. If you weren't here for that, I'd encourage you to get a CD, listen to it online, because you've got to understand what the gospel is. The way to heaven is not trying to be good. The way to heaven is not trying to be good. The way to heaven is trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. You've got to settle that in your mind. And so, if need be, listen to it again. 
This week, I get to talk to you about why. Why it is important to share the gospel. Last week, what? You understand and receive the gospel. This week, why it's important for you to share the gospel. You know, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you, you've got to develop an unshakable conviction about the importance of sharing the gospel. And then next week, the next two weeks, uh, Pastor Ryland is going to teach you how. How to fish for people. And honestly, I think he's cracked the code on this for us. I mean, I am really excited about where this series is headed. Now, you may be thinking, uh, Pastor Kelly, I love Jesus, but it's better if I just keep that to myself. I love Jesus, but if I try to tell someone about him, I'm going to get in over my head. They're going to ask me questions I can't answer. I'm going to say something wrong, and I'm going to screw this up. That, that's why we have all these negative emotions about evangelism, because we don't know where the conversation is going to go. Are they going to get angry? Are they going to reject me? Are they going to laugh at me? Are, are they going to ask me questions I can't answer and I'll look stupid? And the unknown scares us. But here's what I want you to understand. In spite of all of that, Jesus' followers fish. That's what they do. And that's what Jesus calls us to do. It's what he saves us to do. It's what he empowers us to do. It's why we're here. Jesus' followers fish for people. So why don't we do it? Three reasons on your notes. First, we don't do it because we don't think we're supposed to fish. You know, we make the mistake of thinking that someone else is supposed to fish for us. Sharing the gospel is great, I'm just not the one who's supposed to do it. That's for the pastor, that's for the preacher, the evangelist, the missionary. That's somebody else's job, not mine. I'm going to clear that up for you. Okay? Second reason we don't fish is we don't know how to fish. And that's why I'm excited about this series, because Ryland's just going to lay out, he's going to equip you to fish for people. That's one of the goals of this series, is to help you to learn. And frankly, I think you're going to be surprised how easy, even enjoyable, it can be. Third reason we don't fish is we're afraid to fish. And one of the reasons you might be afraid to share the gospel is you're thinking, I don't want to be one of them. Okay? And in your mind, you're thinking of the stereotypical image of an evangelist and so I want you right now just picture in your mind an evangelist picture the person in your mind and I don't know what your mind goes to but my mind goes to someone in a, a white suit with white shoes and a white belt and big hair okay now if you're wearing a white suit and white shoes and a white belt tonight I apologize for this illustration Okay, it's, it's always dangerous when you start describing people in illustrations. I remember one time, just to add some interest to an illustration, I put a picture up on the screen of a guy wearing a weird outfit. And uh, to my chagrin, I looked out and sitting right there was a guy, actually right there, was a guy wearing the exact same outfit. Okay, so you just, you got to be careful. Okay. So when you, but when you think of an evangelist, you may think of someone really loud, really boisterous, uh, maybe to the point of being obnoxious. Maybe the person on the street corner yelling through a bullhorn, the, the turn or burn type. And I had a family member that was like that uh, when I was a kid. At every family gathering, man, she was on fire for Jesus. And, uh, you know, I would remember she would pull in the driveway and everybody in the family would groan. And I, in fact, I would go hide in the corn crib till she went home because it was just so overpowering. And now I'm sure that those types occasionally win someone to the Lord. And, and maybe it took somebody like that to break through your shell and, and win you to Jesus. But that approach is not what won me. In fact, I want you to take that picture of that evangelist out of your mind and now I want you to think of the person who actually led you to Jesus and how would you describe them and you would probably use adjectives like kind and caring 
and generous and, and prayerful. You know, they fished for you not by throwing a stick of dynamite in the water. No, no, they put together a lure, uh, some bait that was attractive and maybe even helpful to you as a person. I, I think of the guys who led me to the Lord. It took three of them because I was really lost. Okay. I grew up in, in a small town in Iowa, a town of 302 people. As a kid, I attended church uh, with my mother and, and uh, her parents, my grandparents. But my father was not spiritual uh, at all. Uh, you know, he didn't even go to church Christmas and Easter. The only time he went to church was when somebody got married or buried. I mean, you had to be getting married or dead for him to show up. Okay? So I got into my junior high years, and, and I just stopped going to church. And dads, that's why I am so thankful that you are here uh, today. Yeah, honestly, dads, you are making a huge spiritual impact in your kids' lives uh, just by being here today. But due to my strained relationship with my father, I, I became an angry, uh, cynical uh, young man. I stopped going to church, and, and I became an atheist. I didn't believe in anyone or anything anymore. I didn't even believe in myself. And I, I was angry, I was cynical, I, I was awash at sea and headed for the rocks. And after high school, I, I moved to a nearby town to attend the local community college. And I signed up for choir. Okay, not because I'm a good singer, but because I thought it would be a good place to meet girls. And it turned out I was right. And the first day in choir... I spotted a cute little blonde sitting in the front row and she was in a carpool with the two guys who sat on either side of me in the base section in the in the back row and their names were Butch and Mitch okay and so this little blonde in the front row turned around to talk to Butch and Mitch about when the carpool was going to uh, go home that day and when I saw her face I said I almost I think I said it out loud that's the girl I'm going to marry now, if she would have heard me say that, she would have said, over my dead body, okay? Because she was a believer. And she knew what the Bible said about a believer marrying uh, an unbeliever, not supposed to do it. But over the semester, Butch and Mitch, they were, they were also believers, and they would share the gospel with me uh, in choir. And we were singing Handel's Messiah, that semester in preparation for a community choir Christmas concert. And so three times a week, I'm hearing the gospel from Butch and Mitch. Kelly, you need to trust Jesus. And I was singing uh, the gospel in the Messiah. For unto us a child is born. And I am just inundated with this Jesus stuff. On top of that, I was taking an art history class. And, and not because I'm artistic, but because I love art, I love history. And it turned out that my art history instructor was also a believer. And this is, this is at a secular community college. This is these people's uh, fishing pond. Okay? So three times a week, I'm in Professor McDowell's art history class, and I'm looking at, at works of, of art, most of which are religious, because the gospel inspired most Western art. And so Professor McDowell would talk not just about the artist and the style of the art, he would also talk about the content of the art, which was the gospel. So the whole semester, Butch and Mitch are talking to me about Jesus. I'm singing about Jesus, the Messiah. Uh, uh, Professor McDowell has me looking at painting after painting, sculpture after sculpture uh, of Jesus. And toward the end of the semester, December 14th, a Tuesday, the end of the semester, Professor McDowell puts up a slide of the Ghent altarpiece painted by the Van Eyck brothers in the 15th century. Okay? Weird painting. Bunch of people standing around in a pasture looking at a sheep on a box bleeding into a cup. Okay, let's zoom in on this and see if that's what you got. Okay, and so I'm in the room, about 15 other people in there. I'm in the room, and I raise my hand, and I say, what's the deal with that sheep bleeding into that cup? 
And Professor McDowell says, well, the sheep represents the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And he is pouring out his blood as a sacrifice for all our sins. The blood is being caught in the gold cup because it's precious. The cup represents the Eucharist. It represents communion. And then I ask about eight more questions about Jesus. And he finally says, Kelly, see me after class. So after class, we're standing out in the hall. I got more questions about Jesus. And finally he says, Kelly, are you a whoever? I said, what? He said, are you a whoever? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Are you a whoever? Have you believed in Jesus Christ for eternal life? Now, I'd been in Sunday school as a kid, so I I knew Jesus was the Son of God. I knew he came at Christmas, he healed some people, he preached some sermons, he walked on water, did miracles. I even knew he died on the cross and rose from the dead at Easter. I knew all of that. But in that moment, I realized that even though I knew all of those things, I had never really believed that Jesus Christ did those things for me. I had to make a decision, a choice, a personal choice. Not my mom's choice, not my grandparents' choice to believe, not even my dad's choice not to believe. I had to make my choice. How am I going to respond to what Jesus Christ did for me? Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And we stepped out of the hallway into an empty classroom uh, with with the lights off. And Professor McDowell prayed for him. Remember, uh, before we did that, he was looking around nervously to to see if we were alone. And I found out later that he could have gotten in trouble, actually could have even gotten fired for praying with me. This guy took a risk to share the gospel with me. And he prayed with me, and I went back to my little apartment, and I pondered these things. And that evening, I made a decision. I'm a whoever. I believe in Jesus Christ. And I called Professor Professor McDowell at home that night, and I told him, told Butch and Mitch uh, the next day at choir that I had trusted in Christ, and they were elated. Uh, Butch was a big old guy, and he gave me a big old bear hug, almost crushed my liver. And, And, you know, I mean, it was just, you know, I'm a whoever. Why did I respond to the gospel? Was it because Butch and Mitch had convinced me Was it because Professor McDowell was so smart? Was it because they answered all my difficult questions? No. It was because Butch and Mitch were two of the kindest, happiest, funnest guys I had ever met in my life. I mean, yeah, they were sharing the gospel with me, but the truth is, in that back row in that choir, we laughed hysterically all the time. These were two of the funniest guys I'd ever met in my life. I mean, we got in trouble, okay? (laughs) That's how fun those guys were. I mean, they were a hoot. And yes, Professor McDowell was smart, but he was approachable. He cared about me. He valued me as a person. He wanted the best for me. These guys were believers who were willing to point me to Jesus Christ so I could believe in him just like they did. They were fishing for me. Fishing for me. And what was their bait? What was their lure? It was love. These guys loved me to Jesus Christ. I want to give you four reasons to fish for people. Four reasons to share the gospel with the people in your fishing pond. You have a sphere of influence. You have people in your life every day, and they are the fish that God wants you to catch. So here's the first reason you fish for people. Because fishing is fun. It's just fun. I don't know of a bigger thrill than knowing that you played a role in changing somebody's eternal destiny. To know that someone is going to be in heaven because of you. I mean, that's just exciting. Jesus said, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You make the angels dance. You make the devil cry when you share the gospel with people. And I tell you what, that's fun. 
You know, I mean, how fun to see somebody who is struggling with meaning in their life and you get to tell them, hey, I got the answer to your problem. I got the, there is no problem that doesn't get better when you introduce Jesus Christ into the equation. No problem that doesn't get better. And you get to be the one that introduces Jesus in, into that equation. We have what people are looking for. We have the cure to misery. We have the strength to endure hardship. We have the hope of a better life. And just how fun to pass that on to other people. Fishing is fun. 2 Corinthians 5, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. You know how God made his appeal into my heart and life? He made it through Butch and Mitch. He made it through Professor McDowell. We implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. Number two, fishing is necessary. It's necessary. You know, it's fun, but it's not a game. This is serious, serious business. It's the difference between heaven and hell for the people in your life. Your family, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers. And for you as a believer, this is not an optional thing where you can take it or leave it. In fact, it's one of the five purposes of your life. It's the only one of the five purposes that you can only do here on earth and won't be able to do in heaven. Because in heaven, everybody's going to be saved, so you can't do the purpose of evangelism. It, honestly, it's why you're here. Romans 10, 13. Look at this progression here. It says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Salvation is found in no other name than the name of Jesus Christ. And to get people into heaven, they've got to call on Christ. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them and I want you to cross out that word someone and write your name into that verse because you're the someone and how will anyone go and tell them without being sent that's what we're doing in this series we're, we're getting you ready to be sent it says that is why the scriptures say how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news Rockbrook you have got beautiful beautiful feet Turn to your neighbor and tell them, you've got... Don't do that. That's just weird, okay? <laughs> Don't do that. Sometimes we think, why doesn't Jesus hurry up and come back? We have been waiting for him forever. Been waiting over 2,000 years. But the truth is, you are not waiting on him. He's waiting on you. Look at 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You're waiting on Jesus to come back. And Jesus is waiting on you to share the gospel so the people in your fishing pond can come to Christ, so Jesus Christ can come back. You know, the challenge of the Great Commission is not to figure out when is Jesus coming back. The challenge of the Great Commission is to get people ready for when he comes back. You want Jesus to come back? Qu -qu Quit squabbling over politics and prophecy and get out there and preach the gospel to some unsaved people. We're not on the date and place committee. We're on the welcoming committee. It's necessary. Third reason we fish. Is because Jesus asked us to go fishing. If you're going to call him Lord, you've got to do what he asks you to do. And five times in all four Gospels and in the book of Acts, in the first five books of the New Testament, Jesus makes the ask. Matthew 28, 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Mark 16, 15, He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Luke 24, 47, With my authority, 
Take this message of repentance to all the nations. John 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Acts 1, 8. Last words of Jesus. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Power to do what? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We are to tell people everywhere. And sometimes we get hung up, hung up. Uh, you know, where is God going to send me? Let me just tell you, God's already sent you. You know, where's God going to send? He's already sent you. He sent you here. Here. Somebody needs to reach the people here, and you're it. Fourth reason we fish is we were all fish once. Earlier, I, I had you pick the person who led you to the Lord. And now I want you to think back and picture you. Picture you in that moment when Christ found you. you know, where were you? Who were you when Christ found you? Honestly, I hope you were a kid. And we get all excited when adults get saved and we hear this great testimony of how ugly their life had gotten and how lost they were and the horrible sins they'd committed and the suffering and trials they endured and how, how great it was when Christ reached down and rescued and saved them. And I love those stories. But the testimonies I love most are the ones where people came to Christ as a kid and they avoided all that crap. I, you know, I love, I love, and we baptize here every month, I love seeing adults get baptized. But what I really love is seeing kids get baptized. You know, we have over 200 kids in Rockbrook for Kids every weekend. And those kids are hearing about Jesus and they're trusting in Him and they are avoiding a life of sin. God bless our children's workers and the kids they reach. And if you came to Christ as a kid, God bless you. I think that's marvelous. It's just marvelous. But for some of us, it didn't work out that way. And as you think of where and who you were when Christ found you, maybe you were more like me. You know, I was angry. I was scared. I was lost. And, and even at, at the young age of 18, I had made some decisions in life. I had developed some bad habits. I even had addictions. And, and I was about to make some even dumber decisions that, that could ultimately destroy my life. You know, Butch and Mitch weren't my only friends. You know, I had other friends who were using drugs. And I'd been, I'd been drinking to excess for years. I started drinking when I was barely 16. I was smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. And, and, my, and my doper friends, they were giving me the hard sell to try what they were using. And I tell you, you know, I was beyond tempted. I was ripe for the picking. Professor McDowell wasn't my only professor. I had other professors who weren't believers. They were atheists. And they had a life philosophy far, far different than how I was raised. And they were influencing me and pulling me to convert me to their way of thinking. Sadly, Katie wasn't the only girl in my life. This was the 70s. Sexual revolution was in full swing. The concept of free love and do whatever feels good. Honestly, it was appealing to my flesh. The world, the flesh and the devil were trying to ensnare me because you know what? They fish too. They fish too. And there was a spiritual battle raging for my soul. And thank God, Butch and Mitch and Professor McDowell waded into the fray and loved me to the cross. Because if it hadn't been for them, I'm telling you, I would have been destroyed. Where were you? Who were you when someone shared Christ with you? And where would you be? Who would you be today if they hadn't? We fish because we were fish once. We fish for Christ's love compels us. 
because we are convinced that one died for all. Christ didn't just die for me. I can't selfishly hold on to the gospel and think, well, man, I'm saved. That's good enough. I'm going to just keep quiet about this. No. I must, must share the gospel with other people. As we close today, I, I want to end with a very personal question for, for each one of you. And the question is, are you a whoever? Are you a whoever? And maybe you're like me. You've gone to church for years. You know Jesus is the Son of God. You know he was born at Christmas. You know he preached some sermons, lived a good life, did some miracles, walked on water. Maybe you even know Jesus died on the cross and rose at Easter. Maybe you know all of that. But the question is, do you believe that he did all of that for you? John 3.16 says, whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. You've got to make a choice, personal choice, to believe in Christ. Have you done that? If not, you can do it right now. Let's pray together. For God so loved the world. God loves you more than you will ever know. That he gave his one and only son Christ died on the cross for you. That whoever believes in him, not knows about him, but believes in him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. God wants to see you in heaven. God, today, here in this moment, we believe in Jesus Christ. We trust in him. And God, help us to share the gospel with others. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook Church. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.